Hello, friend. Welcome to Judson Memorial Baptist Church. I'm Travis Norville, pastor of this wonderful congregation. Thank you for investing your time and spirit and presence with us as we worship together online. This service uh, is our first foray into trying to take portions of the Sunday morning service and adapt them for the online service. Um, so this is a shortened version of, of what happened Sunday with a little bit more uh, participatory elements. I'd like to thank you for um, watching this, but I also would ask you, would you please give us a little bit of feedback? Um, what, how, how did it look to you? How did it feel? How, what was the experience? Uh, also, there will be a time uh, next Sunday uh, for the online prayer requests. So if you have any, would you please share those with us? You can go to JetsonChurch.org and find the contact information. Or please feel free just to text me, 612-300-6746. Just let me know uh, if you have a request or if you want to call, just put the request in that way too. Uh, we're just looking to communicate with you how you feel comfortable. Um, and we'll go from there. This morning, the uh, theme for the day is holiness. Uh, how do we be a, a holy people? And I have three ways that you can be like Jesus. Um, practicing holiness. Uh, practicing uh, the gift of healing. Uh, it's probably not what you think, so give us a little bit of time. And uh, enjoy this service and let us know how you're doing, a little bit about yourself, and uh, feedback on what you think of the service. Thank you much, and peace, so, friend. Uh, from this perspective. So, today, uh, I want to welcome everyone, first of all. Uh, today is, uh, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about holiness for the theme of the day. And today is uh, uh, my 19th anniversary of my ordination. So those of you who wore red, to, uh, for those of you who intuited that it was this day and wore red or colors, variations of red, thank you very much for that. Um, we'd like to do that. So uh, it's a story about ordination and holiness. So as you can see, uh, I'm wearing a red plaid uh, as a shirt. So I asked Lori if she would make my ordination stole. And she said, yes. She said, what, are the, what is it supposed to look like? And I said, well, it's got to be red. Can you make it red plaid? And so this was the closest that you can make red plaid as a, uh, as a, as a piece. So thank you, Lori, for that. But um, So ordination happens. I don't know how many of you have been to ordination services. Uh, but they ask the ordinand to uh, get on their knees, and everybody surrounds them, and they put their hands on the person. So. Um, you may be thinking, hold on, did you say it's your 19th anniversary? But didn't you graduate in 2000? Shouldn't this be your 21st anniversary? Well, this, uh, maybe you may or not know. I tried to, I tried to be ordained in West Virginia, uh, but, but I was not able to do so. Uh, I thought that I could kind of charm my way through the uh, ordination committee just because I knew the people for, you know, at that time, about 25 years and thought they would look past some of the things. So I knew that going in that I was going to be charged with... Uh, some questions, so I was prepared for them. I thought, okay, they're going to ask me right off the bat if I am pro-life or pro-choice. And I'm going to respond, I'm pro-choice, and then they're going to tell me, no, you can't be a pastor. Or I thought they're going to ask me, do I support women in ministry? And I'm going to say yes, and they're going to say, no, you can't be a pastor. Or I thought they're going to ask me about the inerrancy of Scripture. And I'm going to say, I don't believe it's, you know, I don't believe in that. And they're going to say, I can't be a pastor. No. It was that my theology of angels was not robust enough. <laughs> or because I didn't believe in hell. Uh, I thought, really, those are the issues we're going to go down on? Uh, but it was. All right. So I uh, went to Lake Avenue Baptist in Rochester, New York, uh, and was ordained there. And the beauty of it was I was able to invite all the people that, that loved me in my life, uh, that helped me be the person that I, I was at that time. And so they were all there, and they were all surrounding me. And uh, one person gave me the charge. Uh, and this person was the person who put their hand on me. Uh, and this guy's name was Jim Breaker. Just a marvelous guy. He retired from ministry. And like a lot of pastors, when they retire, they have no idea what to do with themselves. And so Jim would just kind of show up at uh, seminary, invite you over for, uh, come up for a picnic at, uh, in a park, or come to his house for dinner. Or he would just be around in the refectory with a thermos of coffee. And he'd wait for you to kind of come by, and he'd just have a cup of coffee with you. And then if he stayed for just like more than half a cup, he would get this grin on his face and be like, you know, I was at this church meeting last night, and they had all these cookies left over. And he'd, out of his pocket, he'd pull out these warm cookies, uh, and he'd share them with you, those kind of guys. He had, you know, he's one of these guys who had like 
sausage fingers. You know, it weren't like meaty hands, like from hard work, but they were just sausage fingers, really big. <laughs> and uh, Jim put his hand on my hand and gave me a charge. And I, you know, they're on my knees, you're emotional, it's a very tiny, and I, and I felt something in his hand. You know, something passed from him to me that I can still only describe as something holy. And I can still feel his hand on my head, the tips of his fingers, digging into my skull. And so I wrote an essay about this, and I wrote Jim, uh, I said, Jim, can you look at this ahead of time? Because I want to make sure your memory of it coincides with my memory. And he wrote back with, uh, he wrote back, I don't know how he did it exactly, but he wrote back giggling. You know, just these little funny remarks at the front. He wanted me to know that he was laughing. He said, you know, Travis, I don't remember anything like that. Only thing I remember is my balance was really off. And the only thing keeping me upright was your head. <laughs> so the only thing, as we talk about holiness, what may be holy to one person may be just balance to another, right? Or what may be this really moving experience for you for another person, it may just be something completely mundane. It all has to do with context. It has to do with your openness of spirit. So it's all to say that what may happen this morning may be holy, or it may be something else. But let's just try to open ourselves up to the uh, holiness of the moment. Uh, if you have a chance, we have uh, prayer request slips are found in your pews. Uh, if you have a prayer request you'd like for a prayer intention, sorry, a prayer intention you'd like for us to join in prayer, uh, please uh, fill this out and we'll ask you to come up uh, uh, in a little bit in the service. Remember, the wooden bowl is for those you'd like to uh, have shared aloud. And in the singing bowl, which is in the pew, but it'll be right here, uh, those are the ones, if you don't want the bread aloud, put it in the singing bowl. So, wooden bowl aloud, singing bowl private. So, uh, for that. Uh, we'd also just like to say thanks to those who uh, volunteered at the Pride booth yesterday and for those who are there today. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their uh, service uh, in that regard. And we'd also like to welcome uh, Molly Marshall to uh, worship this morning. Molly is the uh, interim president at United Seminary and uh, a Baptist theologian superstar. So uh, we're grateful to have Molly with us this morning. So Molly, welcome. And uh, welcome to worship. I'll ask if you could uh, our hymn for the morning is 283, Spirit of the Living God.
We are a community of quest where we gather to study and search. All are welcome here. We are a community of service where the gifts we give and receive are compassion, forgiveness, gratitude, and devotion. All are welcome here. We are a community of joy and laughter where the worth of every individual is celebrated always. All are welcome here. Margo Willett, and I've been dabbling in Judson worship services off and on for about two years. What convinced me to join in late two, uh, 2019 was the church's upcoming vote for the solar panels, which only members could vote on. I thought, what? What in the world would be a better reason to join a church <laughs> than to be able to vote for the solar panels? Though COVID did limit in-person Sunday services, I quickly realized that there was a lot more to Judson than the solar panels. And I found this community of people, you being some, through little Zoom frames, who were pretty darn open-hearted and open-minded. and. This guy over there, right there, uh, who, conveyed, who conveyed some fairly inspiring messages that challenged my personal resistance to organized religion. The poem I'm going to read is called Clearing by Martha Postelwick, who's the pastor of Recovery Church in Minnesota. For me, the poem has felt like encouragement to rid some of my personal cobwebs of anger and occasional self-pity and unearth my capacity for truth-telling and forgiveness as part of my own spiritual journey. Clearing, a poem by Martha Postlewaite. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, Create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your own cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world, so worthy the rescue. <laughs> I'm Pam Jorn, and unlike Margo, I've been here forever. <laughs> but it's great to have you join us, and I love that poem, so good choice. I found during this, um, during this last year that um, I was a sea of confounding emotions. It was a difficult year for lots of reasons. COVID and its isolation, then we had the George Floyd murder and all of the rioting aftermath and then we had the election <laughs> and so I needed multiple voices and so I'm reading two very short poems the one by a very contemporary writer and she does what I think only poets can do finds um, gets to the heart of the human experience lays it bare, and then offers a little splash of sardonic humor. And the second by an ancient old poet, and it's a word of inspiration. So the first, I Remember the Carrots by Ada Limon. I haven't given up on trying to live a good life, a really good one even, sitting in the kitchen in Kentucky imagining how agreeable I'll be. The advance of fulfillment and of desire, all these needs met, then unmet again. When I was a kid, I was excited about carrots, their spidery neon tops in the garden's plot, and so I ripped them all out. 
I broke the new roots and carried them like a prize to my father who scolded me rightly for killing his whole crop. I loved them, my own bright dead things. I'm 35 and remember all that I've done wrong. Yesterday I was nice, but in truth I resented the contentment of the field. Why must we practice this surrender? What I mean is, there are days I still want to kill the carrots, because I can. <laughs> and then this by Rumi, the ground. Today, like every other day, we wake up empty and scared. Don't open the door to the study and begin reading. Take down the dulcimer. Let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. heard and I invite you to imagine that we could see these prayer intentions like smoke maybe or lightning or glitter coming from the hearts and minds of all of our um, friends and community gathered here today and I invite you to imagine that you could smell these prayer intentions like incense or summer rain coming from the hearts and minds of all of those gathered here today. And imagine that you can feel viscerally the prayer intentions of all those gathered here today like dew or velvet Feel it on your skin. I invite you to take a moment now, breathing in these prayer intentions of all of those gathered here today. And now I invite you to imagine the prayer intentions of all of those who have gathered here throughout the decades. <clears throat> Imagine their prayer intentions filling up the space from all of the weddings and baptisms and funerals, the longings, the joys, the hopes, the grievings, of all those who have spilled this space, imagine it as an energy that you can breathe in now. See all the Christmas pageants and youth lock-ins, excitement and joy and playfulness. coffee and donuts, conversation, taking the energy of all that has filled this space throughout the decades. And imagine too, as uh, Minneapolis celebrates pride, all of the prayer intentions of those that have gathered here throughout the ages having to be closeted, having to hide themselves from others. See that energy filling up this space.
breathe in all of these prayer intentions throughout the ages of this church. What quality or word comes to mind as you take this all in, as you feel the prayer intentions of this community through the ages? What does the energy of this intention have to tell you about your place, your role in this community? About your place, your role with each other? about your place in the relationship with mystery, with God, with source, spirit, however you define that. And now let's just focus on our breath for a few moments, breathing in that energy of all that has come here and breathing out your own energy into the mix. still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know Be still Thank you, everyone. Let us pray in the manner Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, our Mother, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
For the gospel lesson this morning, it is uh, Mark chapter 6, verses uh, 30 to 34, and then they jump, uh, all, the lesson does, all the way to um, 53 to 56. Now you wonder, why would they take a jump like that? Well, I mean, they're kind of you know, going through the stages of the lectionary. Um, there's also something to think about, you know, who, who chose the text? And one day I was having lunch with one of the people that was in charge of the Revised Common Lectionary. And uh, this person um, is sitting there at the lunch table pontificating, won't, won't, won't stop talking. And the whole time they've got, it delivers at lunchtime at the table, and they've got salad dressing all down the front, and like a big thing of chicken salad on their cheek. And I thought to myself, this person is in charge of picking texts that we read on Sunday morning. So sometimes when you get to a point when you're, if you follow the lectionary, and you come to a point like this where they skip over, you know, 30 verses, and you think, it's that chicken salad person a bit uh, that was in charge of this Sunday. So um, we're just kind of roll with it, but just to give you a little heads up on what's going on. But these little stories about Jesus taking some time off. The, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away into the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like a sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land and moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about the whole region and, to, and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into the villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Thus ends the lesson for us this morning. So my biggest fear during the pandemic was that you know, there wouldn't be a church to come back to. Or if there, if there was a church to come back to, it would be in ruins, and it would be just a smattering of people. Uh, and I had that fear all, a lot, quite a bit. Uh, just, I remember just walking specifically one time around Todd Park thinking, I've got to find a new job. There's not going to be anything to come back to. Um, but luckily that wasn't the case. I mean, on one hand, human beings are communal animals. Right? We need to be in community, we need to be around each other. So I should have just taken a deep breath and go, okay, people are going to find ways to come back together. But there has to be something a little bit deeper than just friendship, or a little bit something that separates us from other organizations. So I offer you, some of you may remember this as a, um, in an email a few months ago. This is, this is in a little bit greater detail. This is the parable or the fable of the church and the motorcycle club. So, I was a pastor of this wonderful church in Rhode Island, and downstairs in the fellowship hall, a Honda Motorcycle Club met monthly. And the president of the Honda Motorcycle Club was also the president of the, uh, you know, the kind of building and maintenance of the church. And I'll be honest, this guy just drove me back because he used, he thought of the parsonage garage as his own personal storage area. And so he went, the garage was full of stuff, and it would be like, you know, one time I remember Lori's trying to put one of the kids down for a nap, and all of a sudden the garage door opens, and he's in there rooting around for something. And I was like, can you, can you find a different time to do this? Can you, maybe some other time? Uh, so, well, he, but he kept, he kept after me. Hey, why don't you come to the motorcycle club and give the blessing for the meal? I think you're really going to like it. Uh, and I kept trying to find every excuse possible not to go. And so finally one day I relented and went. In the back of my mind, I thought, I'm going to gather every piece of evidence that I can about the motorcycle club to 
prove that it shouldn't be meeting at the church anymore. Uh, that was my little sinister plot. And so I go, and what do I find? Uh, the sea of people downstairs in the fellowship hall, and they all have on black leather vests, and they all have on yellow polo shirts with these Honda Motorcycle Club of Rhode Island patches on them. And they're all wearing blue jean shorts. Uh, it's kind of really an odd look. And the entire fellowship hall had this aroma of homemade chili. So I gave the blessing, and then I sat back with my mental notebook and started taking notes. And then all of a sudden, after the course of 15 minutes, I realized the joke was on me. The Humanist Motorcycle Club that was meeting in the downstairs fellowship hall, everything they were doing was 10 times more holy than anything that happened upstairs in worship. For example, um, upstairs in the sanctuary, people avoided their problems and emotions as if their lives depended on it. Downstairs, the motorcycle club, people poured out their problems and sobbed in front of everyone. Upstairs, people avoided, and you would think, uh, uh, you know, they avoided passing the peace of Christ. Downstairs, the motorcycle club, they would walk up and hug each other, or in the middle when somebody was sobbing, they would go over and hold them up, put their hand on them. They greeted each other as they walked around and People talked about their failed marriages, or people were saying they were afraid to come out, but this is a safe place to do it, and so they did, and they supported them. Upstairs in worship, people felt very comfortable, settled, in, and they settled into their heads. And downstairs, at the motorcycle club, they operated from the center of their hearts. And I felt like, if the church can't be more like the motorcycle club, then we probably should close our doors and just become a social organization and open and have a once a month potluck or something. Now, here's the, here's the parable where it gets into a fable. The motorcycle club eventually disbanded. Despite their vulnerability, despite their authenticity, despite their beauty, they never shared their community with others. They never, they never extended it to a new generation of Honda motorcycle riders. The church, on the other hand, survived, barely. They sold the parsonage, along with all that rhubarb that was cultivated and planted and cared for for years. They called a part-time pastor, and the church is in the, in the bowels of entropy, right? It shrinks every Sunday. The church had access to the holy by its rituals, just by its understandings, but they chose to ignore it. The motorcycle club had access to the holy, but chose not to share it. Neither can be held up as working models. And I hope, my prayer is that both of those possibilities withered and died during the pandemic. As a church, we should be a place that is accessible and encourages access to the holy, and we should be uh, present with it at the same time. Now, maybe you heard, I'm sure you have by now, on June 18th, 2021, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops voted almost 75% to move forward with a motion to draft guidelines for communion, specifically allowing for local bishops to deny the Eucharist, the communion, to pro-choice politicians, with the specific uh, centering on President Joe Biden and Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. <clears throat> Now, there's all kinds of reasons to react to this. But when I heard that, all I, did, all I could think about was all the times, as a child, I attended Mass, generally at, for a funeral, um, and at a Catholic church, and, and they had to open it, and they had an invitation for communion. And not knowing, I would just go up, or start to go up. And then a family member or a friend would put their hand on my shoulder and say, this is not for you. Or... I brought back all the times in my church. I was told before communion, remember, this is only for the worthy. Or I brought back all the stories of LGBT friends and family members who were told they were neither welcomed nor affirmed here. 
or the stories of divorced and consenting adults living in loving relationships. We're told, we're told, they're not worthy to take this. Or the shared stories of all the people looking and judging at people in church because they wore a hat in the church. Not looking at you, Joyce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Or all the story, I mean, uh, of the time that the kid came into a church who reeked of pot smoke, and all everybody did was sit there and stare at him until he left. Or the kid one time who came in who just thought a little differently and expressed it during a prayer request, and you saw the judgment just turn their power on him until he left. All those times. Pope Francis condemned the vote. He did it in a very sneaky way in a sermon saying communion is not the reward for, reward for the saints, but bread for sinners. By denying, what are the bishops doing by denying communion to someone? Whether it's you or me or someone else. They are saying this person, these people, are not worthy of the holy. Now our mission is to create and nurture an environment where access to the holy is encouraged and made available to all. Now yes, sometimes that may mean it feels cheap or a little too easy. Well, I'd rather be cheap and easy than difficult and judgmental. Or maybe it's like this. If you are ever running on the parkway or you're riding your bike and you try to pass my lovely bride, she says, I'll let you pass me but I'm going to make it work for it. Right? She's not just going to pull over her bike or she's not going to slow down. She's going to make it work for it. So there may be a little bit of that too in the whole thing, right? We may make people work for it. We're going to let you have it and access, but at least you know, show up, be present. Is that okay, Lori? <laughs> Pretty accurate, yeah. So if others are shutting doors, Let's open ours as wide, as wide as we can. If people say they're spiritual but not religious, SBNR, there's actually a term for it. You don't roll your eyes. Because more than likely, they've got a damn good reason for feeling that way. For not wanting to be associated with the religious institution. Instead, let, let's explore with them. Say, you know what, I probably have the same objections you do. If people come seeking bread, we're going to give them a stone. You know, last night I was at a lawn concert. It was the uh, 50th anniversary of the release of, uh, you know, the James Taylor and um, Carolyn Smith. Carolyn Smith, Carol right? Well, Carolyn King, right? Car uh, Carol, oh, come on. <laughs> Carol King, right? Well, I mean, that, 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 I mean for, uh, for fairness, right? I mean, that record was released four years before I was born. Okay, so, um, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. so I was sitting on, a, was sitting on a, uh, a lawn listening to these songs being played, and you know, because it was the different voices, people singing them, you started realizing, uh, you know, the spirituality behind some of those songs. Uh, and here's the thing, if, if, if the church doesn't offer people access to the holy, they're going to find it in all kinds of ways. So why not be a proactive way of seeking those things? In the gospel stories, you remember, in that little story, did you hear about the end? That people came from far and near and begged just to touch the hem of Jesus' cloak. And all who touched it were healed. People who did not have access to the holy now had the holy walking among them. And they would move heaven and earth to get near the holy just to touch the hem of a garment. Because when you have access to the holy, you're healed in ways that are deep and moving. Now, you and I are not the kind of holy vessels that people are clamoring to touch. I mean, look, we just spread out voluntarily, right? But that doesn't mean that you and I don't have the same power that Jesus had. Now, last week I gave you a, an example of how to be like Jesus. And I'm curious if anybody did it, right? The practice was to go to the bookstore and take the Joel Austin books off of the religion section and put them in the comedy section, right? That's kind of a nice, subversive way of acting like Jesus. And I encourage you to do so this week if you haven't done it already. 
This week I've got three ways, other ways that you can be like Jesus. You too can heal people. You can heal them of their wounds. Now you may say, I'm not holy, or I don't believe this will happen, or we can't become the motorcycle club overnight. So any of those res uh, responses, let's repeat C.S. Lewis's famous retort, right? Pishaw. Pishaw, right? Get over yourself. Now, will you and I heal someone of their cancer or repair a broken relationship or bring about peace where there is division by doing these three things? Let's be honest, probably not. But you can at least stitch back one broken fabric. And if you could do that, that would be no small feat. It's three ways you could be like Jesus by paying attention and giving away holiness. Number one, you can give someone your undivided attention. Have you ever been present with someone in a conversation, you're talking to them, and you know they're not paying them one word of attention to what you're saying? They're only either thinking of what they can say next, or they can think of, well, you just know they're somewhere else. Give someone your undivided attention in a conversation. Look them in the eye, and all of a sudden you can see that person be transformed. Now this can be, let's be honest, it can be abused, right? You can have someone that will just dominate a conversation and just uh, talk on and on and on. There are social practices you can say, you know, Let's put a pause now on this conversation. Or let's put a semicolon right here, and we'll come back later. But just giving someone your undivided attention. Acknowledge that they are holy and worthy of being listened to. Now here's the next one. Number two, say thank you as many times you can this week. Thank you for the breeze. If the rain ever comes, thank you for the rain the water to brush your teeth with, bread with dinner, air conditioner. Don't experience something without giving thanks. Honor the holiness of the experience. This is one of the things you can say thank you out loud, and no one will, will look at you bizarre. You know, why is that person saying thank you all the time? They probably will interpret then that they did something that you are thankful for and feel better about themselves too. And start saying the other most powerful, number three, the most other powerful expression in the English language of two words. I'm sorry. Numerous times I've been in a situation and watched the countenance of the other persons uh, across from me change drastically just by saying, I'm sorry. Maybe you were the cause of the situation or maybe I had nothing to do with it. But just by offering a genuine apology, I'm sorry. You heard someone, you heard their pain, and you offered it. The holy people I have known in my life, and think about the holy people you've known in your lives, they've all given me their undivided attention for just a few moments. When I was a kid, these were the people that would sit on the floor with me so they could look me in the eye. They were people who were always giving thanks, they were always blessing, they were always willing to apologize. They healed, they healed people just by acknowledging the holiness of the moment or experience, by listening, by saying, I'm sorry. Now last week, I, I shared one of my uh, desert mother experiences, one of my, the desert mother that I go to. Uh, we all have our own Abba's and Amas. Last week, it was Amma Brene. Uh, you know her as Brene Brown. This week, I'd like to share with my desert father, Abba Fred. You know him as Fred Rogers, or Mr. Rogers. Abba Fred used to teach that um, when he was with someone in the hospital or who was experiencing deep pain, he would whisper to them before he left and said, would you remember me in your prayers? Now someone asked him, why are you doing that? Why are you asking the person? You just want to give them a job, aren't you? To make them feel worthy and to make them feel good about themselves. And he turned back and he said, no. People that are experiencing pain are closer to God than people that are not. And someone who's close to God, who's got a, maybe a little bit more access to the holy, 
If they could just remember me in their prayers, I would feel much better. Now, if you start saying, I'm sorry, if you start saying thank you, if you start giving people your undivided attention, your heart's going to be a little bit tender. You're going to be in places where you're going to be a little bit more broken than you would be otherwise. I dare say you're going to be a little bit closer to the holy than you would be in other situations in life. So be prepared if you take on these three ventures for this week. Pierre de Chardin, the, uh, or Tellier de Chardin, the Jesuit scientist and mystic, once said, do not forget the value and interest of life is not so much to do conspicuous things as to do ordinary things with a perception of their enormous value. Ordinary things with a perception of their enormous value. Ordinary things like <clears throat> listening to someone, saying I'm sorry, saying thank you. There's enormous and healing value in those practices. May we be a people in a place where access to the holy is free, accessible, and encouraged. Let's receive this blessing. Uh, may you go. Your heart's a little more tender. Your soul's a little more open to the possibility of being vulnerable. These bodies of yours being authentic in this world, offering love, joy, and peace.